Natalia. I'm a front end developer and I'm also a fine artist. And that means like painting, canvases, like old fashioned stretch it yourself, not the element canvases. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about practical color theory for people who code. And I'm not going to make you do the raise your hand if you code thing. I'm assuming that's going to be all of you. Uh, so let's get right to it. You are not creative. You are a technically skilled technician operating a cold mechanical device. Just kidding, don't tweet that. That's not about you. Um, when photography first emerged in the painting, like fine art and like paintbrush, canvas pa painting dominated world, uh, painters were really quick to say, you photographers are decidedly not artists. You are mere, you know, documenting kind of chemists working on this, you know, chemistries, technology. You need to be uh, using a paintbrush and a canvas if you want to be a real artist. So. With this division between real artist and not artist, creative and not creative, being so old, I wonder if anybody here felt like uh, they related to this a little bit. I don't know about you, but I see history repeating itself with developers and designers and this gap between developers and designers and then real artists in the fine art world. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that, yeah, I fell victim to this myself. I used to teach fine art. I used to think that the only kind of way to be creative was to be a painter, and I went to art school where I learned all sorts of things that are incredibly outdated today. And when I finally quit and became a front-end developer full-time, I heard the same thing. Aren't you going to miss being creative? How can you possibly go back, go from this creative world of painting and fine art and art galleries and sit at a computer, this stupid cold machine, all day and not be creative anymore. That is exactly when I realized how these photographers must have felt. You know, like, uh, are you kidding me? I'm absolutely creative. I mean, think about the work that you do as developers. You are working on an infinite canvas that changes size and shape, right? You're using all of the colors of the rainbow and you're able to glow these colors at just about every person in the entire world. And you're able to shape your ideas into something that someone can interact with anywhere in the entire world and you can shape their experiences however you want. Now usually this is the part where I go off at every conference and I talk about like, yes, CSS is creative, but I had all the speakers before me today do this for me with the genitive art and then, um, you know, the please don't do this 50 shades of gray and what happens if you don't use colors the right way and you just add them on. So I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna do the short pep talk where I say labels are limits. Please don't sit here thinking this color theory talk is not for me. I'm not a designer. I'm just, you know, doing my code here. Labels are limits. If you are interested in design, you can learn design. And if you're a designer interested in delving deeper into code, you can do that as well because ultimately, these are just patterns, and I'm going to be talking to you about one of the oldest design patterns, color theory. So let's get to it. Now that you're all excited about being creative, I do want to backtrack and say that design is really, really hard. There are a lot of decisions that go into it, and something as simple as picking a color is usually the very thing that scares people away from delving deeper into design. Because it seems like, how hard can it be? I'll just pick a color. Well, my website needs a couple more colors, so I'll just pick a few more, and then you get disaster and somebody yells at you. Uh, it's extremely, extremely vulnerable, because there's no tests failing if your colors clash. Uh, there's nothing stopping you. There's no compiler saying, well, you don't want to put these two colors together. This will look bad. You usually only hear about it either from your coworkers who are like, whoa, stick to your code, buddy. Or you hear about it from your client who may say things even more vague and insulting like, that's ugly, pick a better color, or make it pop, or the worst is, I'll know it when I see it. So it just can seem like this horribly overwhelming random thing, and isn't it just a little safer working in the code where there's lots of logic and reason and you can predict what's going to happen next? Well, good news, I can't fit four years of art school into a 25 minute talk, though I'm trying my best, but I'm here to kind of inspire a cognitive shift that color theory and how to pick colors and create color palettes has been studied for a really long time. And that information has been available to artists for a really long time. But for some reason, it hasn't really crossed over into the digital world as much as I would like. 
Uh, we have all the tools we need. We have SAS, you know, this preprocessor. We've got all these variables. We can set any color we want. We can do all sorts of functions and make code do lots of stuff. But we're not really doing it right now. What we're doing is usually, like we saw this 50 shades of gray, we kind of pick a color, and then we pick another color, and we just keep stacking it at the bottom and writing our color variables the same way we write, you know, old school CSS. We're doing all these amazing functions everywhere else, but for our color variables, we're just kind of, uh, we tell a designer to do it, or we make something auto-generate it for you, and, and, and then it just doesn't really work for you. So let's backtrack. Let's start from the developer side of things and deal with information, because that's what we do. As developers, we work with information, right? Some ideas are abstract, some ideas we make visual, but we absolutely deal with information. So now, why would we ever pick colors at random? Color is information. It can make us do lots of stuff. It can make us feel lots of ways. And a lot of talks focus on things like, you can find berries in a field because colors set these apart. And there are predators you can escape. And colors help you identify those in the wild. But I said this was practical color theory. And say you have a project, you have an app to develop, and you need these to be, co this is useless information, right? I mean, we have all sorts of societal rules for what colors mean, like sometimes we associate pink with girls and blue with boys, even though there's no biological basis for it. We just, it's a very persistent advertising technique from the 40s to sell women twice as many baby clothes. Um, there's also all sorts of weird, cool science stuff I can get really distracted with, like wearing the color red has a statistically significant correlation between you wearing it and you winning contests. Why is that? We don't know, but it's a real effect we feel. So again, it can feel really random and overwhelming, and you just have to, pro you have to believe me when I say it totally isn't. Practical. Let's go back to websites. This is a tech conference. Look at this beautiful website. It's incredibly bright. Uh, oh my god, it, it looks even brighter on this projector. Uh, this is exactly what I'm talking about with colors, right? Why did this get picked this way for this kid's website? We associate bright colors with childhood. We all know that, like, yeah, kids like bright colors. I mean, everybody knows that. We're not sure why. And this totally works. Well, there's the biological justification there. Like, science knows that kids are attracted to bright colors because kids are trying to seek out stimuli to develop their brains. And then we associate it with childhood. Right? You'll never see an investment banking website with these colors. right? You'll usually see beige or something. So all of a sudden, these kind of back and forth between what we associate with colors, like, well, I guess bright colors mean kids, and purple means, I mean, blue makes you smart. I don't know. That's the random stuff I'm already done talking about. We're moving on. We're talking about the modern world where science leads the way. Color is light. It is our perception of light. And it's our little slice of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are interpreting with our actually really outdated eyeballs that cannot compete with what computers can do. Uh, and it is, again, studied, logical, and predictable. And unfortunately, uh, what I can get out of an art school library and what I can see on the internet, all the resources available to developers doing work on the internet, um, it needs a lot of updating and a lot of translating. My favorite, personally, uh, my favorite resource is a book from the 1940s. And it makes sense to me because of, again, art school. But if you were to go look at it, you'd see all sorts of outdated documentation. Like, uh, you'll see things like, you need to use ivory black. Is that white or is that black? Naming conventions are terrible. And you absolutely have to have, <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely like that. You've got to have, um, the difference between ultramarine blue and thalocyanide blue is monumental, and your entire color scheme will fail if you don't use the right one. And then finally, it's got a lot of really distracting and amazing information in it, like mummy brown is actually a color used that, that they used to make out of crushing up mummies. Imagine reading that and then not immediately going on the internet to do, like the entire history of why did they crush up mummies for the perfect brown and what was that. Um, so this is what I did. I took all of the knowledge in my head that I have accumulated over art school and mixing colors and mixing paint, and I wrote some functions about it and seeing, 
can I actually take what's in here, make some software do it so I can focus on the cool stuff? Because that's kind of the purpose of software, right? Making sure that I can do something else. I can offload this into some software and I can focus on the bigger picture. So here we go. This is what we have to deal with. Who in this room, there's always one, can tell me the relationship between FF1500 and 00EAFF? No, <laughs> I know you know it. Yeah, back there in the back. Yeah, it's exactly the opposite of it. I'm, again, I'm really sorry that you know that because nobody's supposed to be able to read this. This is not abstracted enough. There's no reason you should be able to look at this and say, yes, of course, FF and 00 are totally opposite. You're this isn't abstracted enough. It's not immediately apparent what the relationship is here. But what I'm trying to get at is that you should always think about colors in terms of relationships because every single time you pick a color, you introduce complexity, you introduce interactions, and you have to build a system. So here's the color wheel. Raise your hand if you've seen the color wheel before in an art classroom in a school. Keep your hand raised if you know that it's also uh, documentation for using color. It's the self-documenting documentation. <laughs> it should be immediately apparent what it is upon looking at it, but the color wheel really is. It's documentation for using color, and it's documentation for color relationships. And combined with the amazing powers of HSL, which in the CSS level three module says CSS uh, HSL is made for humans. It's made to work like the color wheel and it's made for you to understand the relationships between colors to make color use more intuitive on the web. So if you get nothing else out of this, it's please Google HSL, working with HSL, and get hex out of your life and make color a little bit more predictable. So keep in mind this big circle of 360 degrees, each degree corresponding to a color on the color wheel kind of like red is zero and 360 degrees, 60 degrees is yellow, and so on. And let's take a look at a demo of what it would look like. Okay, let's do it. You said color relationships, let's pick some colors, but I can't use a color picker, and I need to pick up some colors at random. Uh, just kidding, you can't use colors at random. Let's look at a demo of what that would actually look like. All right, let's see, and blow this up to a giant, giant size. So, this is a website that has some colors picked and it has a color scheme and it walks you through all sorts of things. So we're gonna start with something that developers really like to do is do something simply. Let's pick one color and have it do the rest of the work for me. So what this is is a website where you can pick your color action color since we all really like picking like the brightest, most beautiful color and the rest of your website will just work. One variable changes, the rest of it works. Because the functions decide like, well, if it's yellow, it needs these conditions, and if it, you know, a lot of if statements here. Uh, so if anybody has a preference, call out a color. I like orange. Just kidding, red, red. I'm gonna go with red. Um, so let's take a look. This is the, if you're really interested, you can follow along online. It's talus.githubio color theory. It's on my Twitter um, as the first thing up there. But, Let's get to it. Let's build a complementary color scheme. Should be easy, right? We've got the color wheel, which we know is documentation now. This is so easy. Just kidding. So you pick a color. Great. We picked red. And this is your terribly floated, uh, what your color, your website will look like if absolutely every single element on your page gets the color red. This is why picking colors is important because can you tell what this page says or what this is? No, so let's build a complementary color scheme which is the opposite on the color wheel. So that means like, let's just get some things where it's not one thing but the other and get some contrast between the two in here. <laughs> Actually, that's what that whole thing up there really was. It's hello world and a simple layout. You generate a complementary color and you know it's 180 degrees from the color wheel. Just have to trust me on that one. And then this is where I kind of deviate from the usual uh, kind of where you get your colors. One of the things that doesn't seem to have made it its way to the web is creating similar lighting conditions. And 
I'm not just like this crazy artist person coming in and saying like, you have to paint. All developers need to know how to paint if they want to wield color in any intentional way. But what I'm saying is that one of the most important things when you are, are using colors is to understand what you're doing. You should be, always be able to answer why. And here, if you get two colors that appear to have no relationship between them, your eyeballs are going to freak out and not know what's going on. It's just like when you try to Photoshop somebody into a photo and you're like, you don't belong there. I see something's different. So one of the easiest way to do this is to establish a relationship by them, between them by using the mix function, which all it means is that this color, I'm just going to go to the picture down here. I made this yesterday. So here's what we're really doing is we're saying this red right here gets a little bit of the blue. And this blue right here gets a little bit of the orange or red. And that will desaturate the colors a little bit together and create immediately similar lighting conditions. And what this does is it creates, you know, I can almost see a difference up on the projector. It creates these similar lighting conditions that tell your brain, don't worry about it. This, these two colors belong together. And you immediately create a situation where uh, you're not alerting your brain, like, oh, something's off. This doesn't look right. And it doesn't pop. And then, back to the top, after you create similar lighting conditions, you create neutrals, highlight midtones and shadows. This, this is the L in HSL. We're not just working with hue, we're also working with lightness so that one thing next to another thing stands out. If you are trying to differentiate elements on your page, because ultimately your goal is so that people can use your page and go to the places you want them and look where you want them, you need to make sure there's enough of a difference between them. So you can add white, you can add black, you can mix more of the other colors into it, but it still needs to come from mixing. And you'll have a color palette that will always look like everything matches together. Essentially, what you're doing is, is you're doing a complex decision tree where you're coming from just one color, you generate the second color in relationship to that, and then from there, you're just, again, mixing and remixing all these colors. And at the end, no matter what color you choose, so we can pick any other color, they're going to work together. They're all going to generate colors that essentially look like they belong together. Because again, you're simulating similar lighting conditions. So we can have any color we want in this room as long as it appears to be in the same kind of environment, our brains won't freak out about it. Because again, we're working on computers, but we're building these things for, for people to look at. And you have to take inspiration from nature. You have to take uh, into account the fact that there were, we're always trying to figure out an, our environment and understand what we're seeing. So the closer we can model it against what we would see in nature using neutral colors and colors that aren't so intense, uh, the more likely we are to not get nauseous when we look at this, to not say, hmm, I see an optical illusion or I see something that doesn't belong, and to say, yeah, all these colors look like they belong together. Moving on, I can enjoy my content. Uh, so. One of the most important things to consider here is contrast, right? We hear about accessibility and contrast and what's important in, in your layout. Let's take out all the color information out entirely. We're just going to not worry about color at all and just drain all of the hue information out of this. Just turn everything grayscale, right? Suddenly, oh, look how everything pops. The secret to making something pop, and this is for all you with clients, is to make everything else not pop. So that's the answer is here. That's all it is. Make every other color duller and you will succeed. So when you take a look at this, remember that hello world we saw? Color is not the only thing you're working with. You're also working with lightness and contrast. And HSL is something that really helps you understand that, that it's not just about the color on, on the color picker, but also it's lightness information, how much light it's bouncing back at you so that even if it doesn't matter which hue you choose, you want to be able to generate a variety of lightness. You can see how those vary at the bottom. And then no matter what, your resulting layout should work. It doesn't even matter which colors you pick. You could be colorblind and do just fine as long as you use contrast and lightness and create color relationships in terms of mixing them together. It's a pretty safe thing to do if you're afraid of picking the wrong color. Finally. Let's see, there's a lot of things in here. I can talk about this all day and probably for four more years uh, since I used to teach it. But at the end of the day, what I'm really trying to do is I want to create a, a 
a library so that you're able to use colors and build color relationships in your applications the way the, that you build the rest of your applications, right? We have all this logic. We have all these, um, you know, relationships between functions. Picking colors at random, just, it's, it's like, it, it just doesn't work for you very well because if you don't establish relationships between the colors, they're always going to clash. Just like if you build an application, just kind of copy and pasting random functions in, things are going to not work together at all. It has to be a reasonable system that you can then maintain. You don't have to go through and erase a whole lot of color variables, and you can just make it a, a, a system that is more, uh, more like the program you want to build. And that is where I've started with it. I would really love more people to get involved with this because um, a lot of times it's very surprising to me coming from the fine art world. Oh, you don't know about the color wheel or that you would mix colors or what happens when you really desaturate something or why you'd end up with 50 shades of gray. Well, it's because mixing gray is a whole adventure in and of itself. Uh, don't get me started on that one. Uh, but I find that in the, in the debate between should designers code or artists code and should, you know, bridging this gap, I think one of the things that gets lost is art isn't some mythical thing that you have to have in here or you can't, you can't externalize it and only your designers can pick a color. Um, I think that we can build some software that can make everybody's lives easier. It's a massive decision tree. It's a lot of decisions and your designers are doing this every single day we could make it a lot easier for designers to do this and a lot easier to make these projects much more maintainable for you so that the next time you want to change a color, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We already have one. It's the color wheel. <laughs> so, all right. My name is Natalia and discussion track. If you have any questions about this, I love talking about colors way too much. Awesome. Thank you so much.